Well, it's fun to be here. I live up in northern New Hampshire, which is about 30 miles from Quebec. So obviously it's a, well, actually you can go to my ecosystem by going up on top of Mount Mitchell. So <laughs> um, more of a spruce forest place. But I have Kukulia. I deal with codling moth. As of last year, I started dealing with brown rot. Um, things are shifting. And in terms of understanding what makes for a healthy tree, for a healthy berry planting. Um, the fundamentals are the same no matter which fruits we're growing. And I want to share a lot about that. And then I want to talk about how we need to think about disease and about pests in terms of some of the spray materials we have to work with. And mostly when I get into the spray part, it's going to be about enhancing those health dynamics that I try to bring out through the ecosystem dynamics. I like to start with, with this talking about healthy plant metabolism. And sometimes we think we know this, but within these next several slides is, is really the unlocking of why I do what I do and how that works in terms of the orchard and, and growing <coughs> great fruit. So just in a blunt way, the things we know is plants are out there in the sunshine and that's where photosynthesis begins. Plant sugars are made. Something happens with those plant sugars that I don't think most of us realize. Um, Nitrogen is combined with the plant sugars, and that's going to create proteins. And from there, um, plants grow on to produce all kinds of secondary plant metabolites. So in herbal medicine, my wife, is Nancy, is an herbalist. You, you really get focused on a lot of that action of the plant because that's where compounds exist that help our bodies be healthy. Photosynthesis is that sunshine combining with carbon and water, and we get plant sugars. And that whole process is really keyed to good mineralization. So we're going to be talking a lot about the minerals that need to be out there in the orchard. Those minerals have a lot to do with um, the enzymes that make everything happen. And they need to be there, not just in abundance, not so much in abundance, but in balance. It's, it's all about balance. And that part is actually handled quite well by the biology, as, as we'll get into explaining. Plants go on from there to take those plant sugars and a good two-thirds of them go down to the roots to be traded with the biology. So when we get to talking about mycorrhizal fungi and sometimes people think, is that depleting the plant? Is that taking away from the, what the fruit tree needs for itself? It's actually into a really big export business because the trading that takes place is really important to the health of what we want to do in terms of growing healthy fruit. And down there in the root zone, that's called the rhizosphere, there's many different locations of trade, the root cells decaying, breaking away, but it's the exchange of root exudates, those plant sugars coming out, and also the species of fungi called the mycorrhizae, bringing carbon to the, uh, the plant and exchanging for certain nutrients. From there, fruit trees, berries, all those plants, go on to create proteins. And the whole protein synthesis process is also very driven by minerals to create the enzymes that are necessary. And when that process is complete, we have a healthy plant. But when the protein synthesis process breaks down, it's going to be more attractive to pests, and it's also going to provide substrates that diseases feed on. You know, one of the things that we've known for a long time is that the form of nitrogen is very important. So when we go in with fresh manure under a pear tree, or we add nitrate fertilization in terms of NPK fertilizers, or we have a biology dominated by bacteria, fruit trees get their nitrogen in the form of nitrates. These kinds of studies going back into the 1970s say that's really a big issue on the disease front. Now today in modern fruit growing, it's really all about yields and having certain medicines to deal with the fact that we're inducing more of a problem by our, the way we grow things. You know, my kind of point of view is I want to figure out how to make that plant more resistant to be able to stand up to disease pressures in its environment and to be able to use gentler methods. So I really have to engage these kinds of thinking about what's going on in terms of plant metabolism. And again, it turns out that getting nitrogen in the right form is fairly simple. And that has t 
totally to do with the fungal bacterial dominance of the soil where we plant fruit trees. So we're going to be doing a lot about talking about the fungal duff, talking about how do we create that fungal soil ecosystem around fruit trees and berry plantings. But when it's fungally dominated, the rhizosphere is slightly more acidic and nitrifying bacteria, which take the ammonium and convert it to nitrate, are less in abundance. And from my perspective, it's all about fungi. So we can talk about the metabolism and, and the compounds being produced, but we're going to really be going in a fungal direction because of that. Now, when protein synthesis is complete, pests are not able to digest complete proteins. But when protein synthesis breaks down, that draws the pests onto the scene. They're able to consume amino acids and the other byproducts of a process that isn't complete. So again, it's just starting to indicate, you know, there's certain things we can do and try to push in a certain direction. And it's all because of how it plays out with the pests and disease. Beyond the proteins, plants produce different kinds of fat, fatty acid compounds, essential oils, and phenol compounds. And these are the compounds that are basically the immune function of the plant. So just like our bodies have an immune system, it's very different in the plant, it's all about phytochemistry, but there is the ability, once a disease is present, to fight it off. And if that didn't take place, this pretty much would be a barren landscape out there because for thousands of years, plants have had to stand up to the pressures. Now we come in and Patrick grows tomatoes and deals with late bright. In a rainy spring, we deal with a lot of apple scab. So rainy summer, you start to see a lot more rots. So our wishes, our desires, we have to do a little bit more to work with that. But the fundamentals of what the plant does in terms of approaching this are one and the same. Now taking it one step beyond, when the plant produces certain phenolic compounds, secondary plant metabolites in response to disease and in response to pests, we now have a term we group them that under called phytoalexins. And this includes things like terpenoids and isoflavonoids. We're going to get briefly into that. You know, this, some of this big word stuff is just so I can practice how to pronounce a, <laughs> a lot of this, but it's eventually going to get to the point where you can really see how it's practical. But this business of the phytoalexin response, that's the core mechanism by which plants resist disease. And I'll, I'll get into how I think that works. This response is also keyed to the soil biology. It really has a lot, again, to do with that fungal dominance. So when it's a more complex soil biology, the plant roots have access to a nutrition in a partially built form. So that means amino acids, partially built carbohydrates. In a more bacterial dominated system, and we'll get into some examples of what I mean by that, they mostly have access to soluble ions. So when nutrition is partially built, the apple tree, the peach tree, the blueberries have more reserve energy. And it's that reserve energy that allows the plant to build more of the phenolics. So again, it's, it's we're going to get into the practicalities of what that means on the ecosystem level, but this is why we're pushing things in that direction. We want plants to have that reserve energy to be able to do more of this. Besides the fact that you can go out and, and, and look at a fruit tree and say, this has really healthy leaves. You know, I actually this year, well, many years, you go through fluctuations and, and as much as you understand things, and as much as you hopefully learn lessons so that the next year is better, um, you're given a different proportion of crop every year based on factors that are way beyond your control. And this year we had a really, really spotty bloom. And so I have maybe a 10, 15% crop. And I knew this was happening last June and July because we had serious rain and serious cloud cover, which really limited photosynthesis. And we're going to get into understanding that when fruit goes from the size, well, apples and pears in particular, go from the size of a pea to a marble to a quarter, in those 30 to 40 days, flower cells are being formed that'll be next year's crop. And when there's not enough energy, both nutritionally and hormonally, then the tree will only have fruit and it won't have the energy to put into flower cells. And without the sunshine last year, I kind of knew, okay, this is coming. <laughs> Um, but despite that, 
I have more healthy leaves than you could imagine. And if, and if I can get people to start buying leaves off the apple tree, <laughs> I'm going to really make quite a living with this. And one of the things you can do in terms of just an analyzing where do I stand on the health scale, or for my purposes, if I use a spray of this or that, does it really help boost this healthy plant metabolism I'm talking about? Well, you can use a refractometer to take a BRICS measurement. And that measurement is, is basically the soluble solids in the sap. So it includes the sugars, but it also includes proteins. Are they complete? Are they not? And a higher BRICS number is just an indicator of you're going in the right direction. So I'm, I'm using this primarily to uh, just work with thinking about what I'm doing. This is anecdotal, but I want to share it. Um, the whole gist of this, we've talked about pests being drawn to consume amino acids, but not complete proteins. I'm going to tell you about some of the food substrates that diseases feed on, which is a result of unhealthy plant metabolism. But the whole gist of this is in order to use gentler means to deal with pests and diseases, we need a plant that is so robust that it mostly doesn't need a lot of help. Now, there's some people who, who think you get the bricks to read 18, 20, 22, and it will be Shangri-La and no pests will be on the scene and you won't have to deal with disease. I haven't seen that yet. And uh, the fact that fruit trees are out there 12 months of the year and there's so many different things happening at different points of the season and certain years there is just an abundance of certain pests or certain years the rain patterns are such and sunlight is less, the whole ability to ward off disease is a little bit less than what it might be in a more ideal year. So I, I think the challenges are always there. It's just, can we get to a point where we can deal with that? But there's a man in um, Oregon. His name is Bob Wiltz, and he grows blueberries for a living. I think his farm is called Sunset Valley. And he's quite into this whole nutrient-dense approach. So he is spraying with compost teas. He's spraying with liquid fish. He's mulching the blueberry beds but in the aisles growing tap-rooted plants, which we'll get into how that's part of the fertility loop. And he's in the midst of a county where there's quite a number of other blueberry growers. And in the last few years, just as here, just as in far northern New Hampshire, a new pest has arrived. That's another part of the fun. It's like every few years we get to have a new pest. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that new pest is spotted wing Drosophila and also known as the Japanese vinegar fly. Mm -hmm. And this is a fruit fly, unlike the native, native American fruit flies, that will lay its eggs into immature fruit. And every eight days, that cycle is repeated. Adults are out laying new eggs. And so it rapidly can build in numbers. And it can afflict the blueberries, the raspberries, particularly fall raspberries. Uh, for us, it shows up in about mid-late July here, Late June? Yeah, probably. And I don't think it's quite overwintering up where I am because we have colder winters, but it gets there through the air currents. So really no one's going to be protected from this per se. On the other hand, in the case of this Bob Wiltz, and again, I have to talk to him direct. I haven't, but I've heard he doesn't have an issue with spotted wing Drosophila. He has them to a slight degree, but they're not interested in his plants because he's doing so much to promote the health aspect, what that insect might want to feed on, what that insect would be drawn. Whereas his neighbors are overwhelmed by the problem and spraying all kinds of toxins to deal with it. 